Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Kathy Yang. Kathy has been practicing Chinese martial arts, Tai Chi and Qigong for over three decades. And as a competitor, has been awarded the title of Grand Champion in a number of prestigious tournaments, including the Tiger Claw Elite Championship, the International Chinese Martial Arts Championship, the USA Wushu Kung Fu Federation Championship, and the Taste of China USA All Tai Chi Chuan Tournament. She has a Bachelor of Science in Clinical Exercise from Boston University and received her master's with distinction from Middlesex University in London, England, with a joint degree from Beijing University of Chinese Medicine. Kathy is the creator of TCM Time, a learning resource website from which she teaches, consults, and shares her knowledge of traditional Chinese medicine. Kathy, thanks for joining me today. Hi, Bill. Thanks for having me. So usually the first question I ask people is how they got involved in martial arts. And I think your answer is probably going to be a little bit different than everybody else's. Um, so uh, your, your your father is Dr. Yang Zhuang Ming. So you grew up in a martial arts household, I guess you could say. Um, how old were you when you started practicing? Do you even remember? I have, I do have early memories. Uh, I think I was around six years old at six. the time. And yeah, just one of my earliest memories is that my father was teaching at a Tai Chi farm and he was teaching all these 20 year old young men and they were in a kind of a leapfrog position, but training to jump high and far. I, I just remember saying to my dad, uh, is that Kung Fu? I can do that. So like, like just a little bit of pride there. Yeah. And, uh, and I did jump through each one of them, which made oh, me feel wow. com confident. But when my dad changed the exercise a bit, um harder like i did fall over and that was also a humbling experience no oh, yeah well. it's part of it um <laughs> how, how old were you how long did you practice before you started competing when were, how old were you when you started competing well i started just more with the the children's class mm -hmm. and i was actually slower than my brothers my i have two brothers an older brother and younger brother they started before me and I wasn't ready because it was all males at the time mm -hmm. and it didn't interest me. Uh, but eventually when they had more of the children's classes, uh, it took about, I would say, seven years into it before I started competing around 14 years old. 14. Yeah. And uh, you, you made uh, several videos with your father as well. Mm, right. Yeah. Was that around yeah. the same time period? I would say... Yeah, with the Kung Fu Shaolin, I did start more early in the later teenage years and then early 20s as well. Like when I started more competing more regularly around 20s. Okay. So where was competition on your list of priorities as a young person? Was that something that was um, high on your list of priorities or was it sort of in the background behind your academics and everything else? Mm -hmm, that's a good question. M my father always have us uh, put education first uh, before martial arts <laughs> and um, just together my parents um, felt really prioritize education and I would say martial arts uh, with tournaments I, around 14 when I first uh, we signed up all well, my brothers and I um, I just remember my older brother saying to me uh, you know dad's paying a lot of money for this uh, you better treat it seriously and yeah. and my older brother was a bit strict with me uh, growing up but I'm grateful for it because I did take it seriously and I think it's because I took it seriously I did train hard and I saw the fruits of it so since then I think tournaments is more like a goal setting um, but I wouldn't say I, it's a high on my list because at some point uh, the real critics that I really value is my dad's own um cri judging criteria and my own inner inner feeling as well yeah that's a great benefit of uh competing i think is that you ultimately end up competing against yourself yeah so, exactly yeah. you're your own worst enemy sometimes it's yeah. true do you have a what you would consider a specialty in your martial arts i would say because i um started with sword really early uh, and that was the first thing my father actually taught us directly me and my younger brother Nikki and I I really value it and I see it as a really advanced art so I would say the things that I'm really passionate about I consider my specialty 
so I would say sword, um, uh, also kung fu, as well. But um, at some point also I I look more towards the internal arts like qigong and Chinese medicine, as my developing specialty now. Uh, what uh, what point did you start to get interested in uh, traditional Chinese medicine? Was it uh, adjacent to your martial arts career? Because a lot I know a lot of us at some point we get injured or something of that nature and we start looking at the healing side of the arts. I think early on, I always heard through my father's stories of his white crane master that he was uh, good at bone setting. So if somebody misplaced the joint, would be able to help them reset joint. And I witnessed that also with my own father helping students. So I saw that early on. I think in my own, when it really started sinking in me, I was around, I think between 10 years old and early 20s, when I started understanding Qigong, um, it started as a, just at a friend's birthday party when you uh, do games and you push your hands against a door. And then mm -hmm. when you hold it there for a minute, your arms just floating up. Yeah. And it was like magic for me. And I, right. I got excited. I showed my dad. And he said, that's not magic, that's Qigong. <laughs> and since then, I, I would really get interested to understand what is spiritual cultivation through my dad's Qigong seminars. And I, the more I understood that self-cultivation, the more I got interested in the healing aspect of it. Yeah, And I would say around early 20s, when I started having more, you know, like developing compassion for people's suffering, I saw that Qigong and myself and my compassion went together with the healing that's it started from there you know the uh, when we do qigong and things like that to people that are out, outside of you know that sort of practice it can seem kind of mystical or esoteric and um but you know you came from a background where your father has a very deep scientific background also he has a big deep background in physics and engineering um and other scientific disciplines did you see qigong uh as a separate modality from that? Or did you see those as sort of two, two sides of the same coin, so to speak? Mm. I would say more the latter two sides of the same coin. My father always has this expression that two is one, one is two. And he would be talking about the, the, the mind and the, um, the lower dantian, the upper dantian and lower dantian. I, I see Western medicine and Chinese medicine uh, as functionally they're two but in physically where we think of them as uh, two but they're one so what i want to say is that i see a bridge between the two so in that sense growing up with my dad speaking from the physics point of view and qigong together it was always uh, one for me uh, but in society and functionally there is two we do talk about them as two yeah. right yeah, no, I'm actually reading your um, father's uh, Tao Te Ching uh, Qigong interpretation book right now. And he talks a little bit about how quantum physics is actually proving things that, you know, were talked about in, in the Tao Te Ching and Qigong in China well, thousands of years ago. And now it's being yeah. proven from the other side, but it's the same concept. So that's pretty it's, exciting. Yeah, I do believe science will catch up uh, with the inner arts yeah. at some point. <laughs> So at what point did you decide that you wanted to pursue a career in medicine? Was that something that you had uh, an inkling of early on, or did you have a completely different idea when you were younger? I think really early on, when I finished high school or around high school, I was already interested in, I had in my mind, uh, wanted to be a doctor. I think just from the general Chinese cultural upbringing, I knew my mom wanted to be a doctor when or nurse in the medical field when she was younger uh, she didn't get the chance unfortunately but there is this prestige around uh, being a doctor so I I looked up to that concept and um, yeah when I went for my undergraduate degree I, I did consider it but I wasn't ready for that commitment yet so I did go into exercise physiology so I said around my early 20s and did you work in that field at all, or did you directly after that decide that you wanted to sort of deepen your uh, medical understanding? Yeah, I 
I think when I finished with my undergraduate degree with uh, clinical exercise physiology, I think I wanted to explore understanding the bridge of the Chinese medical side. So that's when I started to explore the Chinese medicine degree. Um, so you ended up in England, right? Uh, at Middlesex University. Yeah, that's right. And they have that joint uh, sisterhood uh, partnership with the Beijing University of Chinese Medicine. So could you talk about that a little bit when you went to into that program? Um, was it more or less what you thought that you were going to experience or was it completely different from what you thought you were going to experience? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I would say I didn't have too much expectation. Okay. So I I was just uh, a sponge open to learning at in that age. So I would say it gave me a foundation looking back. At that time, it was more just a uh, study hard and I think I saw it more academically right. rather than the practical even though we did have the practical experience but when you're in the academic environment it's more about the, the education at that time. Is the attitude towards traditional Chinese medicine in the UK much different than it is in the United States? Do they have a different uh, outlook or different um, laws and regulations regarding practice of traditional Chinese medicine there? Uh, when I finished, which was um, around 2010, 2012, there, I don't know what it is now, but um, you didn't need a license, whereas like uh, you do need an acupuncture license in the United States. Right. So passing certification and then getting officially licensed. At that time in the UK, you needed to register part of an organization, um, have a registration and they just check if you meet the basic educational requirements credit. So um, I don't know what, it, I haven't looked into it now, but I, I don't know if there's a license required. So the joint program, how did that work exactly? Were you in uh, England for a while and then you, you did end up ultimately going to China, correct? You, yeah. So yeah. How did that work? So it was a four year undergraduate program and then you had the option of doing a one a one year additional for a master's and um, during the master's you would have the opportunity to do a placement a clinical placement in Beijing uh, University of Chinese Medicine where they link you with the major hospitals there and so I had the opportunity to study uh, 16 weeks um, working in different departments from the respiratory clinic to the um, to pediatrics and skin care. Um, so I got to see a lot of major departments and mainly that integrative um, approach where the doctors are pretty much trained in Western medicine and Chinese medicine. So I, I really saw that it could work well together. What, what do you see the role of um, traditional Chinese medicine for as far as preventive medicine is concerned? Uh, was that was that emphasized much in your clinical experience in China, or was that um, sort of a? I guess I guess if you were in a clinical experience, it wasn't more preventative, right? It was sort of like a hands on or diagnostic or. Yeah, I would say I got to in my clinical experience training at the time, I got to see Chinese medicine play the role of complementing. Western medicine. So basically, if uh, if you had side effects from certain medication or from chemotherapy, you could have Chinese medicine, herbal medicine, and acupuncture support the the side effects or recovery process. I didn't see it as much the preventive side, but in my own father's uh, qigong practice. I think that's where I started to understand that lifestyle plays such an important role and Chinese medicine is really good at finding the root cause of, um, of an illness and preventing it and then maintaining it. I think uh, I see Western medicine as really strong in the acute uh, circumstances. So when somebody does need surgery or immediate uh, balance, like medicine can have 
give them immediate relief. Yeah, I think Western medicine definitely has something to say for it as far as trauma medicine especially is concerned. I mean, there's no question about that at all. But when you talk about the, the root causes of illness, something that really interests me about traditional Chinese medicine is the people that I studied with talk a lot about the role of uh, the emotions in illness um, because our emotions directly affect our endocrine system. And for instance, you know, stress causes a rise in cortisol, which can cause inflammation and inflammation can lead to all kinds of different disorders and disease, diseases. Could you talk about that for a little bit? What's your take on emotion and illness? Oh, that's, uh, I really like that topic. And a lot of what I teach does emphasize about the emotional aspect that Chinese medicine brings because uh, Chinese medicine really I, I can understand more that mind body and spiritual connection through the Chinese medicine philosophy so I I really see emotions can kill you faster than a disease itself so I see a lot of our root causes is linked with mind and emotions and my approach uh, just in this last year is now understanding uh, more about mental health and and that Western medicine is promoting understanding more of when mental health. I I want to start bringing in the Chinese medicine tools that that emphasize that mind body connection. Could you maybe give a couple of examples, like a, you know, just sort of a um, hypothetical example, for instance, of how like traditional Chinese medicine could help with emotions and stave off illness. Can you can you elaborate your question a little bit? Um, let's see. What would be something that you could suggest that a person would do, for instance, to control their stress? Um, you know, may, maybe from a perspective of something complementary to someone, like let's say, for instance, someone had been diagnosed with something and um, that was causing them additional stress. What could be something they could do to, you know, try to control that along with whatever other treatment they were receiving through traditional mm -hmm. treatments? Yeah, I would say Qigong and Tai Chi and Kung Fu actually give a nice uh, distraction. So people really need an outlet, uh, especially when we're so uh, dwelling on certain negative aspects that might bring our uh, energy trapped more. So we really need an outlet to let that energy free. So I think by shifting our mind to positive um, things that are self self-care and self-cultivating uh, it can be you know it can be the exercises themselves but it can also be simply something social like um, watching television and laughing with friends and family so i think distraction is a really good outlet yeah i agree i, I find that sometimes when you know people are um you know, getting depressed or whatnot, if they can just force themselves to do something physically, it can get things moving in the right direction. So it's it's very helpful, often overlooked, I think. Agree. Um, and just to add to that, uh, I think something my younger brother taught me that sometimes when you're in that state, uh, just going through the motions, it, it can slowly pull you out of that state. You just have to, you really have to stick to a routine uh, rather than going down uh, we say don't, going down that toilet hole yeah. that spir <laughs> down, downward sp spiral yeah. right right so you know for for someone who was maybe looking for a, a tcm practitioner in the west what are some things that you would recommend that they look for you mean like what they want uh or things to be care uh, how to choose yeah. the right practitioner? right right exactly so I would say if you're in the United States, again, you do need to look for somebody who is a licensed practitioner. Uh, there is that governing system that helps regulate and ensure the safety of patients. I think second is mainly that you can find somebody you can connect to because that human relation is really the essence of that chi flow. So um, somebody you could build trust I think what's really helpful for uh, Westerners is when uh, the Chinese medicine practitioner explains things rather than just doing it, but explaining why they're doing it, uh, what's the reason behind it. Uh, because I think the more the individual can understand Chinese medicine concepts, the more it empowers them to make the right choices. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's one of the... Uh selling points, I guess you could say, for traditional Chinese medicine is that it lets 
the person who's being treated feel like they have a hand in their own treatment, uh, yeah. especially when it's explained properly to them. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that's yeah. Yeah. I think that's also my drive is I like sharing um, Chinese medicine, um, the knowledge of it. Yeah. So that's basically what you do with TCM time. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. Yeah. TCM time. It started uh, in 2011, uh, just when I had finished my degrees. Uh, it was just started really informally. And we just uh, in my dad's retreat center in California at the time. That's the background you see. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, just he he invited me to teach just the students there. And yeah, it was a it was a good experience, really humbling in the beginning. Um, I think at some point, um, my younger brother, again, Nikki, he just, he came up with that term TCM time, which is just learning Chinese medicine with Kathy. So um, it kind of had a ring to it. So over about four years, by 2015, then I started getting officially invited to teach at workshops and seminars. And um, since 2015, so it's been eight years in the developing, uh, it really took off actually during the pandemic. It was a silver lining when we had to shift. Um, I had to stop traveling to teach and shift online teaching. And, uh, it took some courage to overcome some of my camera shyness. Uh, but but I think it's been such a rewarding experience because I've been able to reach people and to to just share something that's been helpful for me and actually has been helpful for others as well. Yeah. I think that was the upside for the pandemic for a lot of people is that they found a lot of things, you know, online, that they probably would have never even ventured to try to find uh, otherwise because they had no choice <laughs> or more or exactly. less trying to decide, but it, it had a silver lining for sure for a lot of people. Yeah. So what time, what types of things do you do through the website? Do you do one-on-ones? Do you do you teach private lessons? What what do you do there? Yeah, uh, so TCM time. I think the main focus is my classes, sure. um, my classes and workshops. So live online learning with me, and you can also have the option if you pre if you can't make the schedule, you have the recording, and you can go to the video library which has all my courses and my workshops and learn at your own pace, uh, rewind if you need to. And then I also offer private sessions, so one-on-one -on -one consultations, uh, whether it's Chinese medicine uh, somebody wants to focus on or more of the, the exercises like Tai Chi, Qigong, and Kung Fu. That's great. So uh, what are your plans going forward for your uh your medical career. I know you've had some experience with Western medicine also. Are you planning on uh, furthering that? Or are you sticking with the traditional Chinese medicine? Are you going to combine both? What's what's the plan? Uh, I'd like to know too, uh, ask above. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do see myself um, in the past year, I've been exploring more of the Western medicine. So I did take um, some nursing courses to try to understand some foundation and just step into the western medicine uh, field itself and it's it's opened my eyes a lot and i think now having this new perspective uh, i want to bring it again back to chinese medicine to integrate and go deeper now in chinese medicine so i i think at this time i'm looking at um, continuing my own research with chinese medicine and western medicine to bridge that gap I want to also uh, develop my acupuncture skills further, so get more clinical experience with that. And now that the pandemic is um, op opening up a bit more, I yeah, I want to continue the clinical skills. And the last is just continuing teaching and uh, connecting with my students. Great. So. You know, we talked about the pandemic a little bit, and obviously that changed the face of the world greatly in a lot of different ways, some good, some not so good. Um, things are changing all the time. What do you see as the future of these traditional arts that we all study, you know, Kung Fu and Qigong, Tai Chi, traditional Chinese medicine? What, what do you think their place is going to be like in the future? 
I I kind of take on maybe I'm influenced by my dad's perspective, which is as a tech AI and uh, computers take over some of the jobs that, uh, you know, more of the labor jobs, hopefully what we will see is that people do have more time for themselves. I don't know if that's the case. I think I see people getting busy here, but I do, I do hope it turns into that we do have more time for that inner cultivation. And I think it will take time before it shifts, but, but ideally, I think that's the direction it will head. I hope so. I hope yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So before we go, can you uh, tell us if you have any upcoming uh, projects that you'd like to promote or would you like to tell people where they can find you? Well, you can find me at tcmtime.com. Uh, if you do want to learn about um, my teachings, you can go on my YouTube channel, just TCM Time. Um, I hope at some point to keep working on a book that I'm working on with my father uh, with Tai Chi Chen and health. So hopefully um, that's my goal over the year, next year or so. Fantastic. That's something to look yeah. forward to. Mm, thanks, Bill. Well, Kathy, thanks for talking to me today. It was wonderful talking to you. Uh, hopefully we can do this uh, again sometime soon. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. They really make me think. <laughs> no problem at all. It was great talking to you. Uh, could you stick around for just a minute? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thanks a lot. And to everybody watching, listening, thanks for joining us. And uh, on behalf of everybody at Dowie, we wish you the best in your life and practice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye.